no electricity, no Wi-Fi, no television. However, this country has weapons of destruction feared by the whole world. How can an isolated and impoverished country with an economy cut off from the world afford to fund a nuclear weapon program and be able to have the largest sophisticated military forces? How does all the funding become possible with decades of sanctions and isolation? This country is none other than North Korea. But where does North Korea even get its money? Not only for its totalitarian dictatorship, but this hermit kingdom is also known for its surrounding mysteries and secrets. From counterfeiting fake money to its new crime business, to Today, take a deep breath as we unravel those dark secrets about North Korea's money-making system. Chapter 1 – North Korea's Economic Background and History Millions of North Koreans suffer from forced poverty and humanitarian issues as a result of the North Korean leadership's system of isolation, brainwashing, and violent repression which has deprived the people of their potential and power. North Korea has maintained strict controls over what enters and leaves the country for many years, keeping it cut off from the outside world. Information is not the only thing that is forbidden, even electronic devices like radio and TV are limited. North Korea has a very strict tourism system that that what is normal to us may not be normal to them like wearing jeans, watching TV, talking on the phone, and even taking photos. Given this type of tourism environment and the unsettling reputation of the nation, how could anyone have the guts to go there? And how does North Korea even get money if not from tourists or from importing and exporting goods? The question is how this nation, which has been cut off from the outside world and shut down for decades, is able to sustain itself financially without relying on outside assistance or trade. Without a doubt, sanctions are harming North Korea's economy. The United Nations Security Council has imposed sanctions on North Korea around 12 times since 2006 due to its development of nuclear weapons and missiles. Unilateral sanctions have also been applied by the U.S. and other nations. Among other things, the sanctions forbid the transfer of armaments and military gear, freeze the assets of everyone involved in the nuclear program, and restrict scientific cooperation. A number of countries have also imposed sanctions, even international organizations, to put pressure on the North Korean government to abide by its commitments to disarmament and non-proliferation agreement. Financial transactions are one of the main areas where sanctions have been put into place which in effect prohibit North Korean institutions, companies, and individuals from accessing the global financial system and its government from receiving money, especially one that comes from illegal means. So imagine living in a country with a limited banking system where you can't use checks, ATM, debit and credit cards, and even exchanging foreign currencies is difficult. These economic sanctions had greatly affected North Korea's food security. The country has a population of 25 million and according to the UN World Food Program, 10 million of its citizens are malnourished. Most families in North Korea sustain on corn because they can only afford two meals a day, especially during the pandemic. Remotely sensed luminosity information indicates that 60% of North Koreans live below the poverty line. Aside from food shortages, the country's standard of living is bad because of an absence of infrastructure, education, and medical care. Not only the sanctions, but also the financial system of North Korea add to extensive poverty. Chapter 2 – North Korea's Economic Model After the war with South Korea in 1953, Kim Il-sung adopted the Jush ideology which means independence and self-reliance in the economy and military, and this paved the way to dictatorship and to the country's isolation. Because of this ideology, the North Korean government implemented a command economy, which means the government has complete control over the distribution and production of goods and services. So imagine a country where most of its companies are owned and managed by the government where doing entrepreneurship activities is difficult for an ordinary citizen and where certain individuals don't have the freedom to invest and put up their own business. So because there is no competition in the internal market, this kind of economic model severely restricts freedom and impedes economic growth. The nation's economy is made worse not only due to trade restrictions, but the regime infringes upon people's rights to life and freedom, such as freely exploring business opportunities and livelihoods. North Korea's economy has an estimated GDP of 25 billion US dollars, or a purchasing GDP of 40 billion US dollars. These figures reflect the nation's economic performance, which according to statistics was decreasing by 0.2% every year. The nation's score on economic freedom is below both the regional and global averages. The North Korean economy is regarded as repressed by the 2024 index, meaning that with those figures, the nation could barely afford to provide quality life to its citizens. The poverty issue in North Korea has been attributed to its poor governance touching even issues concerning human rights and dignity. North Korea's economic decline is said to be linked to its focus on funding weapons rather than the food of its citizens. North Korea has been prioritizing its military since the reign of Kim Jong-il. 
Kim Jong Illinois implemented a military first policy in which later in the assumption of Kim Jong Yung Yun Yan, the country's ambition to nuclear powers heightened by exhibiting more of its weapons, terrifying its neighboring countries. For a long time, North Korean dictators believed that nuclear weapons would ensure the regime's survival so they have chosen their corrupted view of power instead of choosing its people, who are supposed to be the true resources of a nation. Chapter 3 Drugs and Weapons Smuggling in the Black Markets So how can the nation as a whole generate income if its government is unable to collect taxes from its citizens due to the limit of private industries and poor entrepreneurial landscape? To make ends meet, the majority of ordinary North Koreans mostly rely on money from side jobs and underground marketplaces, where their income cannot be traced by official salary statistics. Black markets have emerged as legal counterparts of Jang Madang which was originally an illegal market that had just received recognition in the latter. The illegal markets are referred to as frog markets in the area since the merchants will flee when the police try to shut them down. Customers can buy rice that isn't allowed to be sold in the approved markets at these marketplaces. According to one report, rice is being sold out of bags marked World Food Program or Republic of Korea. This specific example raises questions about the involvement of dishonest government employees who profit financially from rice that is meant for public distribution. Black market is used too in drug manufacturing and trafficking which is notably one of the most profitable trades in North Korea. So despite the sanctions, North Korea could trade in the shadows and with the black market North Korea was able to establish a crime empire. The first known instance of this behavior was in 1976 when several diplomats from North Korea were arrested for smuggling illegal legal cigarettes, booze and hashish into European nations. As more ambassadors were apprehended for similar offenses, North Korea's operations got more difficult and the country switched from distributing drugs to producing them. Methamphetamine would be created at North Korean state-run factories starting in the 1990s and then distributed with the help of Asian criminal networks. It has been discovered that North Korea's methamphetamine is primarily sold in Japan. About 1,500 kg of the material, or one-third of Japan's stockpile, were captured by Japanese officials in 1997. The estimated value of the seizure was $3 million. North Korea's yearly drug trafficking is estimated to be worth $500 million by conservative estimations and $1 billion by more severe projections. The weaponry trade is another method by which North Korea engages in black market activity. The nation has a history of making agreements with any nation, regardless of that nation's political beliefs or goals. Similar to drug trafficking, these black market transactions have been orchestrated in large part by North Korean embassies. To obstruct their nuclear program, North Korea is prohibited from dealing in arms as a result of the previously mentioned sanctions so they resorted to smuggling small weaponry instead, such as machine guns, rockets, and Kalashnikovs, which are North Korea's main exports. North Korea is regarded as one of the world's top exporters of weaponry, valued at an estimated $6 billion yearly, along with Saudi Arabia and Iran. The sanctions are spurring debate about being deemed as fangless, but North Korea managed to evade it. For instance, in 2016, customs officials detained the North Korean vessel Ji Shun, which was traveling toward Egypt under Cambodian flags. More than 30,000 rocket-propelled grenades were found by the agents concealed beneath iron ore shipments. According to UN reports, this was the largest seizure of ammunition in the history of sanctions against North Korea. Despite that, US officials reported that North Korea still continued to trade with a number of nations and organizations, including Syria, Hezbollah, Uganda, and the Congo. North Korea's military exports brought in $580 million, according to a 2001 article published in the Japanese Daily Yomiyomiyuri. Chapter 4 North Korea Makes Fake Money Despite the capital city, Pyongyang's denial, North Korea is believed to be involved in counterfeiting operations wherein the origin of the 45 million fake money was traced back to North Korea. It is even estimated that the country's earnings from counterfeiting over a number of years range from 15 to 25 million annually, and that makes North Korea the biggest source of fake money in the world. Apart from trafficking in drugs and weapons, North Korea has a vast network for the distribution of fake money. North Korea is the source of high-quality counterfeit $100 bills. According to U.S. Secret Service reports, this fake money is referred to as supernotes, which are nearly hard to tell apart from authentic specimens. When a team of experts on forgeries examined supernote at Keb Hana Bank in South Korea in November 2017, they noticed that the person who created the counterfeit money appeared to have resources and advanced technology like those of the government. The U.S. money printing plant is a very costly business. Over the past five years, North Korea probably needed to invest $150 million only to stay up with both known and unannounced changes in U.S. currency. There is a limit to the rate at which they can trade that money for products. 15 to $30 million a year is what most North Korean watchers estimate. They are forced to ship this fake money in little ways. 
like tour groups and small-time crimes, as no institutional partner in their right mind would do business or take money from them. So imagine how this country cannot even give food security to its people, but can afford to buy such high-tech money-faking machines. According to a U.S. government source named Danny Glazer, North Korea has refuted claims that it distributes and produces counterfeit currencies, but the overwhelming weight of evidence suggests otherwise that North Korea's involvement is undeniable. The amount of forgeries being manufactured is difficult to estimate, but U.S. government officials claim that North Korea is estimated to generate fake money worth $15 to $250 million annually. For many years, North Korea has used the black market to finance its nuclear and military programs. The state has used every tactic under the sun to finance its goals, from faking money to the sale of drugs and weapons, since engaging in black market activities can only be their means of trading. There is no doubt that North Korea's establishing a criminal empire was perhaps their means of survival. The North Korean government is like a mob family that happens to run a nation that isn't legally funded and even its ambassadors are forced to support themselves financially by operating a criminal organization that deals in drugs, smuggling weapons, stealing money, or counterfeiting. The bottom line is that North Korea's economy was somehow founded on these illegal trades. Chapter 5 North Korea's New Crime Business Room 39 is a covert party group in North Korea that looks for ways to keep the leaders of the nation's foreign exchange slush fund intact. The organization's annual earning is estimated to be between $500 million and $1 billion or more. It engages in illicit activities like producing controlled substances such as methamphetamine and heroin by converting morphine into more potent opiates and counterfeiting $100 bills. And now with the rise of digital technology, it has become involved in cybercrime across the globe. Who would have thought that a country with a low electricity supply and no internet would be outrageous in hacking million-dollar companies, cryptocurrencies, and banks? As South Korea accused North Korea of being behind a recent wave of cyber attacks. Two defectors talked to Al Jazeera about their experiences, providing some insight into the inner workings of the communist nation's cyber warfare program. It has been found that children in North Korea who showed intelligence in math and analytics were being pulled out of school and sent to special training. Prodigy recruiters use a pyramid-shaped system to select bright children from across the nation who excel in arithmetic, coding, and critical thinking and assign them to groups at Kimsong. After graduating from Kimsong, they were assigned to study in North Korea's top universities. Following a two-year expedited program where these students are sent to China and Russia to reinforce their understanding of hacking and other technical abilities after completing an accelerated two-year university program. Following their training abroad, they are sent to different combat units as cyber warriors. So, these students after years of study, it's either they will work in the military or do the underground activities for the nation, such as with North Koreans in Room 39, who were both responsible for the legal and illegal financial activities for the nation. The most popular group of hackers tied to North Korea is the Lazarus Heist, who were confirmed to be responsible for the hacking of a Bangladesh bank. According to a recent analysis by TRM Labs, hackers connected to North Korea stole at least USD 600 million in Bitcoin in 2023. If North Korea is shown to have been the source of other hacks in the latter part of last year, the total might reach about USD 700 million. Since 2017, threat actors with ties to Pyongyang have taken over cryptocurrency valued at about USD 3 billion. The purpose of this hacking activity is of course to make money, so North Korea could continue funding its nuclear program. It also served as a warning to the rest of the world that, despite its current economic state, North Korea is a nation to be reckoned with. Chapter 6 Jobs and Trading Inside North Korea So to basically make money you have to create an income-generating activity such as trading, or to put simply, you have to do the buying and selling of goods and services. Taking this concept on a large scale, with North Korea's sanctions and trading restrictions, it's kind of difficult to fathom how this country can have its income and fund sources for its military and other industries. Let's take a deeper look at that. According to the Factbook, North Korea's industries include those that produce military goods, machinery, electricity, chemicals, mining, metallurgy, textiles, food processing, and tourism. So basically, most of these industries are government-controlled since it's likely hard or illegal to put up a private company there. The most common jobs in North Korea are in the military and farming. North Korea's economy is closely linked to the military-industrial complex since a significant amount of labor and resources are allocated to the production of weapons, military-related infrastructure projects, and the upkeep of a sizable standing army. Historically, North Korea has also made significant investments in heavy industry, concentrating on fields including metallurgy, mining, chemicals, and machine building. These industries nevertheless employ a large number of people, 
even if many of their facilities are out of date and impacted by sanctions. For numerous ordinary North Koreans, subsistence farming continues to be essential but old tools, old farming methods, and food shortages hinder this industry. The nation also possesses abundant mineral resources, such as magnesite, coal, iron ore, and a variety of rare earth minerals, but its development was not given importance since the country prioritizes building an army. Although sanctions and outdated technology prevent mining from reaching its full potential, it still contributes significantly to export earnings. So for ordinary North Koreans to have at least a decent economic status and sustainable income in North Korea, they have to work in the military industry and other government-owned companies. Basically, the people there worked in the government, and it's the government who gives them wages. Because the economy of North Korea is so secretive and lacks public statistics available, it is infamously difficult to determine the average income in the country. However, according to a number of sources, North Korean workers make comparatively little money on a monthly average compared to other countries, which is understandable given the nation's closed-off and tightly regulated economic structure. According to reports, government workers' salaries are insufficient to meet their basic necessities. Working there would just give you a salary of $1 to $3 per month, so this forces the North Koreans to partake in illegal economic activity. And this leads to the emergence of illegal markets, like what they call the black market where the citizens can work, buy and sell, and earn without getting controlled by the government. But the black market holds more secrets beyond that. Chapter 7 North Korea's Secret Helpers North Korea's primary legal imports were petroleum, coking coal, machinery and equipment, textiles, grain and agricultural and fishery items, and its primary legal exports were minerals, metallurgical products manufacturers, including armaments, textiles and agricultural and fishery products. How come North Korea can still buy and sell outside despite the sanctions? While many countries issued sanctions against North Korea, several powerful nations remained its supporters. China China and North Korea's state relationship started in 1953 when North Korea tried to invade South Korea. China is considered North Korea's closest ally. It is its biggest trade partner. While other countries punished North Korea by closing their markets to it, China, on the other hand, has been its biggest supplier of commodities. Despite sanctions and a blow from the COVID-19 epidemic, over 90% of North Korea's imports and exports go to China. According to data from the Seoul-based Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency COTRA, bilateral trade expanded tenfold between 2000 and 2015, reaching a peak of $6.86 billion in 2014. However, Beijing voted for UN Security Council sanctions in 2016, which stopped North Korea's trade from growing. Based on data from Chinese trade, Beijing maintained parts of the UN sanctions against Pyongyang in 2018, such as prohibiting the supply of fuel and limiting banking activity. However, the flow of illegal products persisted in formal trade for things like cell phones, diesel fuel, seafood, and silkworms continued along the China-North Korea border. If we think of it, despite North Korea's ideology of self-reliance, the truth is that North Korea is economically dependent on China. Their relationship dates back to when a great famine hit North Korea, it was China who came to its aid, and even until now, in some aspects China is still North Korea's economic lifeline. Despite the UN pressure on sanctions, Beijing resisted it and was still helping Pyongyang, North Korea's capital, because if not, it could topple the regime. Why is China helping North Korea? The reason was beyond historical, but strategic. Aside from China's relation to North Korea as its shield against Japan and the US, this was a way too for China to maintain the status quo by not stirring conflict between South and North Korea. Because if ever war breaks out, North Korean refugees might be crossing the eastern China's border and that would be disruptive to China's social and economic status. In case of war, while North Korea has little to lose, China is significantly more vulnerable and stands to lose a great deal more in terms of potential profits, capital investments, and human lives. China which is positioned to take the lead in world affairs and lead by example in international relations, cannot afford to engage in a real nuclear exchange with North Korea. Russia Russia was another country supporting North Korea. Their relationship dates back to the Soviet Union, and even after its dissolution, their relationship still continued. The 2024 Annual Threat Assessment ATA of the U.S. Intelligence Community IC states that Russia has been giving North Korea diplomatic, economic, and military concessions in exchange for weapons. Despite the sanction, Russia was said to be quietly shipping petroleum to North Korea. When a famine struck North Korea in 1990, Russia delivered some humanitarian aid, and that continued until now. Russia was giving food assistance like 50,000 tons of wheat in 2011, and oil shipments which is stirring concerns to the US and other countries who promoted sanctions against North Korea. Furthermore, since Russia has been at war with Ukraine, 
There have been worries that North Korea may be providing Russia with weapons, as evidenced by the UN's finding that missiles discovered in Ukraine were manufactured in North Korea. So, now the UK and us are accusing North Korea of trading weapons with Russia in exchange for oil. Also, just this year, South Korean officials confirmed that North Korea has sent 6,700 containers carrying millions of munitions to Russia since September in exchange for food, as well as raw materials for weapon manufacturing. So basically, the thing that ties North Korea and Russia's relationship is weaponry. North Korea makes money and gains other economic assistance by supplying weapons to Russia, and Russia in return depends on North Korea for weapons. Chapter 8 The Dark Psychology of North Korea in Relation to Its Resources Unlike other countries where its main resources are food and agriculture, North Korea's primary resources are weapons. They make tons of money out of that. Weapons and other crimes are the country's primary business. But how did the people of North Korea manage to endure such scarce living conditions deprived of their basic needs, hopes, and dreams? This relates back again to the kind of ideology the country has embraced. Yeah, North Korea's government system and ideologies have an impact on its economy and on the lives of of every single citizen. While its neighboring countries adopted development and capitalism, North Korea did the opposite, adopting communism in isolation, and this entered the cult personality of its regime. The Kim Dynasty's leadership shaped North Korean identity and ideas by claiming that only government-approved ideals could enter the minds of its people since these values uphold and form their society. North Koreans are expected to give their leaders, the Kim family, extreme reverence. Aside from the fact that they can breathe, eat, and drink, the citizens there basically don't have a voice. They can't question much more than protest against the government. But how would they do that anyway, when all of their lives they were made to believe they have the perfect leader and the perfect country with no reference to what perfection is because they weren't allowed to see the outside world? So whether they're living in scarcity, paid very low salaries, or hindered from freely doing legit business, it won't matter to them for they were conditioned in the first place. That everything their leader is doing is for the entire country's welfare. Patriotism and reverence for the leaders exceed individuals' economic needs, leading its citizens to believe they have the best life and aiding them in enduring poverty. The Kim dynasty maintains their cult propaganda by following similarities to the bite model of authoritarian control, which controls its citizens through behavior, information, and thoughts. The family is portrayed as godlike entities that rule daily life as one aspect of the family's clinging to power. Positive stories about Kim Jong-un are regularly featured in state media, and the school curriculum includes songs and lessons about the family for students. Imagine a nation whose education system is centered on social indoctrination of the regime, instead of skill development. What kind of citizens would it be producing then? This links back again to the country's main priority. For the North Korean government, its assets aren't its people, so why would they give time prioritizing its citizens citizens' welfare and developing their potential other than for the government's use, when for them, weapons are the most important and are the country's source of power. Chapter 9 The Rich and Poor in North Korea Despite North Korea's below-poverty line economic condition, 2 million North Koreans are members of the elite class. The elite own cell phones and possibly even cars, and they can attend the best schools and housing programs. They have the first choice of what's available when food and medical supplies are scarce. Status is frequently determined by whether or not an individual kisses the ass of their superiors or possesses a unique ability that the regime greatly appreciates, such as building nuclear bombs. The regime is essential to the elite's existence, and they stand to lose little or nothing by opposing it. Because they mutually support one another, the elite in North Korea is in turn supported to the greatest extent by the country's leadership. Songbun, which means ingredient or ancestry background, is used to categorize North Korean citizens into three main castes core, wavering, and hostile, in addition to about 50 subclassifications. In North Korea, Songbun decides if someone can be trusted with authority, granted opportunities, or even receives adequate food the U.S. The Committee for Human Rights in North Korea and the American Enterprise Institute state that Songbun affects the citizens' access to educational and employment opportunities. With this kind of social system, earning money for a day is basically a survival for citizens in the ordinary or lower class. If you're a person who isn't useful to the regime's goal, which is military and weapons, then you won't have comfortable lives there, and your only choice to earn more is through the black market, hustling, and bribing to make ends meet in a country that is scarce of basic necessities for life. Therefore, surviving in this kind of class system and in this economically depressed country would require you to drop your own unique potential and instead align yourself, your skills, and your dreams according to the government's goal. So, to earn a more sustainable income, and to gain access to the elite class, you must be fit to work as a military officer, cyber warfare specialist, missile launch officer, special forces, or security officer. 
Chapter 10, Nuclear Kingdom. Experts estimate the regime's nuclear weapons to be at least 30. North Korea detonated a weapon in 2017 that was at least 10 times more potent than the ones used in 1945, proving that the country had created very devastating hydrogen bombs. It's possible that North Korea already possesses the nuclear weapons and medium-range ballistic missiles necessary to strike both South Korea and Japan. The dictatorship also maintains programs for biological and chemical weapons. In a closer look, North Korea's nuclear weapon program serves as a shield for a sanctioned nation like theirs to continue its existence. Other than its weapons and military, there's no reason to fear North Korea. In fact, China could even win an economic war against it. Without their nuclear power, they would be powerless, but regrettably they have it, and it's their source of power. This cultic communist country was deemed rouge and mad. Its unlikely reputation has in some aspects served as leverage to get what it wanted. Despite its nuclear power, the North Korean government is unable to meet the requirements of its people in terms of food, electricity, and lifestyle. Unverified sources suggest that his people are even spending money on ballistic missiles instead of food. North Korea's obsession with nuclear power is being validated by its goal of survival, but it looks far less than that judging by Kim Jong-un's recent propaganda. The truth is that behind the regime's nuclear weapons is an insecure dynasty trying to hide its weakness by taking pride in its weaponry. The destitute North Korean government is so fearful of losing power that it is prepared to resort to extremely aggressive tactics in an attempt to intimidate South Korea and the United States. Chapter 11 North Korea in the Future North Korea faces an historic turning point in its future driven by its growing illicit activity and stubbornness to acquire nuclear weapons. As the nation looks ahead, these unconventional strategies will most likely dictate its direction, pushing it further from global trends and deeper into isolation. Crime business is the bedrock of North Korea's future. With international sanctions tightening, legitimate trade routes are closing and Pyongyang has become increasingly dependent on black markets. This shift isn't a temporary fix but a process of adaptation as time passes. North Korea will certainly diversify its criminal portfolio in the coming years. Already a huge revenue driver, cybercrime will likely grow exponentially. Success with cryptocurrency heists by the Lazarus Group with more than USD 1.5 billion snatched between 2017 and 2022 indicates this will be a main focus. More sophisticated attacks will likely target exchanges, as well as decentralized finance platforms and even central bank digital currencies. Another mainstay is likely to be drug trafficking, particularly methamphetamine production. State-run factories that churn out high-purity North Korean crystal are ideally positioned to ramp up production. More facilities could be converted to drug manufacturing as traditional industries wither under sanctions. The low overhead and high profit factor of the meth trade make it a tempting option for a cash-strapped regime. Likewise, human trafficking is likely to increase. The export of North Korean citizens, especially women and girls, into China is a grim but lucrative industry that requires little infrastructure. The future also is changing for counterfeiting, North Korea's most notorious venture. Even as tougher anti-counterfeiting efforts have made passing fake U.S. dollars easier Pyongyang isn't abandoning this art, instead it's diversifying. We can expect a rise in forged euros, yuan and other major currencies less protected than the dollar. North Korea will likely also venture into counterfeiting luxury goods beyond cash. The targets could include designer goods and pharmaceuticals, as well as industrial parts. These criminal enterprises are no longer sidelined but are poised to become part of North Korea's economic future. Traditional exports such as coal and textiles will continue shrinking as sanctions go on and perhaps get tougher. Instead, organized crime Crime will flourish in their place, creating a support system for the regime in a shadow economy. Crime is now an underlying economic basis in North Korea, with several estimates declaring that these illegal operations could possibly contribute up to 30% to North Korea's GDP by 2030. But what is going to determine North Korea's future is certainly its nuclear program. Nuclear armament is not a bargaining chip, it has become the regime's existential strategy. A credible nuclear threat isn't about deterrence for Kim Jong-un, it's a tool for international coercion. There will be no stopping the relentless pursuit of nuclear advancements, just more tests and provocations. In the short term, North Korea will likely concentrate on miniaturizing warheads that would fit on missiles. If successful here, it would make a potentially explosive milestone which would permit nuclear-tipped ICBMs to reach the U.S. mainland. At the same time, we may see programs to build up the nuclear stockpile. North Korea could rival established nuclear powers with 100 to 200 warheads by 2030 according to some experts. We also expect missile technology to develop very rapidly. Tests of solid fuel ICBMs signal a new direction for North Korea. These missiles can launch in minutes and have greater mobility and are therefore more difficult to preempt. We may even see tests of even more advanced systems in the future multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles MIRVs 
hypersonic glide vehicles, and even submarine-launched ballistic missiles. This nuclear fixation will have profound economic impacts. A quarter of North Korea's meager resources, perhaps 25 to 55 percent of its GDP by 2030, will go into weapons research. Such military spending is unprecedented for such a poor nation. This will create a siege economy with all sectors working to support the nuclear program. Missile factories that could manufacture consumer goods will instead produce parts for missiles. Weapons design will be the sole focus of research institutions that can spur innovation. This trajectory carries a terrible human cost. Living standards for ordinary North Koreans will likely fall further as more resources are devoted to nuclear ambitions. Some estimates put more than 60% of the population facing food insecurity by 2030. It is expected energy shortages will worsen, with blackouts spreading from rural areas into Pyongyang itself. Healthcare and education, already minimal, may be cut to bare essentials. This domestic hardship increases the risk of internal instability. Although the Kim regime remains in power, prolonged deprivation could provoke violence. We could see more defections, especially from the elite disillusioned with the nuclear policy. Local uprisings in the areas most affected by food shortages could also occur. But instead of reforming, the regime is likely to retaliate with enhanced surveillance and tougher crackdowns. On the international front, North Korea's future will result in greater isolation. Its twin pillars, a crime-based economy and an expanding nuclear arsenal, will further estrange it from the global community. Countries that once conducted limited trade may cut ties entirely to avoid getting involved in North Korea's illegal activities. Even China, a long-reluctant ally, could tighten border controls to prevent drugs and counterfeit goods from reaching North Korea. This isolation will be further worsened by the nuclear issue. As North Korea moves closer to a fully operational nuclear force, diplomatic engagement will become more risky. With not many possibilities for denuclearization still available, the U.S. and its allies might follow a rigid containment strategy. This could include tougher sanctions as well as naval blockades or interception of suspected North Korean smuggling ships. North Korea could end up in a technological quarantine by 2035, isolated from most trade and financial systems. But paradoxically, that isolation could encourage North Korea to take an even more nuclear posture. Feeling trapped, the regime may turn to a more brutal nuclear doctrine. This could include threats of preemptive strikes or even proliferation, selling nuclear technology to other rogue states or non-state actors. Such moves are extremely destabilizing and also might cause arms races in East Asia and the Middle East. However, there's a slim possibility of a different future. North Korea could recalculate if the pressures of crime-fueled isolation and nuclear brinkmanship become too great, we may see a return to the negotiating table with a stop on nuclear production in return for easing of sanctions. Economic zones like Kaesong or Raisin might be revived, allowing cautious foreign investment. Such openings would be tightly controlled, but they could offer a break in the crime nuclear cycle. But such an optimistic scenario is still unlikely. North Korea's leadership regards its criminal activities and nuclear stockpile not as liabilities but as creative responses to a hostile world. They believe these tactics have kept the regime in power through decades of pressure. Such perception makes a fundamental policy shift unlikely. In the next decade or two, these elements likely will become more ingrained, changing the country's economic and strategic picture. This road leads to a future of contrasts. On one side, a regime that survives through illicit global networks and nuclear coercion. On the other hand, a population further impoverished and isolated. Such a course creates new and unpredictable threats to international security. 